overarching argument of the book is very really twofold. Literary criticism, going back to what Socrates calls the ancient war between the poets and philosophers, has very often aligned itself with power. The moral standards of the state, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a sense in which Emperor Augustus uh, plays this role really, really quite perfectly. Allegorical reading of the uh, Song of Songs also plays this, this role very well. Re- readings of poetry which reflect the interests of power. Reading, uh, readings of poetry re- reflect the interests of powerful institutions and the, the, need, the needs of those powerful people and institutions to keep the uh, populace in line in a way that St. Ovid always refuses to stay in line uh, and in a way that the text of the Song of Songs is constantly threatening to burst out of line. The form of criticism that most at work. The form of criticism we see, we don't see it work now, this permanent suspicion, actually has some of its roots in responses to that authoritative imposition on poetry. Some of the earliest allegorical readings of Homer, for example, finding the, the warp and wolf of rhetoric in the, in the weaving and unweaving of Penelope Shroud, the shroud that she's weaving at the end of the Odyssey, for example, were ways of trying to uh, defend against the, the accusation of people who, who argued that Homer and Hesiod put all the, all the display and shame for men into their portraits of gods, for example, the 6th century of uh, BC, uh, pre, pre-Platonic, pre-Socratic criticism. And this pattern in criticism, it warped and it changed in the Gregorian period in the West. The scholars like Charles Homer Haskins and a bunch of others will, will, will refer to what they call 12th century Renaissance. Uh, Renaissance in in Europe might have started uh, earlier than we normally give credit to, only that it is crushed utterly. So twin developments here are the poetry and lifestyle of the troubadour poets, you know, Guillaume the Ninth, Bernard de Ventadorm, uh, Beatrice de Dia, et cetera, et cetera, and the uh, heretical theological movement of Cathars. Two groups, those really only common elements seem to be an insistence on believing and living as they saw fit, as opposed to, according to the dictates of the what everyone in the Lenadi region regarded as the foreign Frankish kingdom. If you travel around Shatnik and Falk and areas like that, you will still find people who have these resentments. Going back 800 years now, they still do not really regard themselves as French. They still really regard Paris as a foreign capital, and French is a foreign imposed language upon them. You see the way this changes poetry after the Albigensian Crusade. You see the way it changes poetry with the early Italian poets, the those of the normal tool, where Love is still spoken of, but it is now spoken of correctly according to the dictates of the poet, according to the dictates of the clerical institution, the church, which is also the roots of our modern university, Bologna and Paris being the first two Western universities. Bologna having its roots in Frederick the First's court, and Paris having its roots in the parish or cathedral schools of Paris. It seemed to me for a long time that, that there's a tie between these things. The, uh, the history of the history of poetry and its confrontational relationship, or it's being confronted by philosophy, it's being confronted by political authority, and the specifically erotic poetry in the West, and the the way it is turned towards religious theological purposes, the imagery, say, of the troubadours, the imagery of a Giacomo de, la, de la Tine, the inventor of the song, being largely identical, except for the end goals of them. The, the troubadours focusing on life here on Earth, and the the early Italian poets, you see this especially in the uh, great developments in Dante and with Petra, uh, placing that love really in the heavens. There's a sense in which political authority, church authority, often the same thing, really was quite oppressive towards poetry and the human emotions and desires that it describes. And that the, the, the fundamental mechanics of that are still at work in this what we call hermeneutic suspicion style, uh, this critique style. And Bruno Latour was talking about this in 2004. Rita Belsky published, published the book Limits of Critique in 2016 and this book in 2017 basically working in this direction this form of critical frankly, I would say domination of poetry has its roots in some really quite disturbing elements of history and ultimately has its roots in the idea that the authoritative teachers the, the first academics would have banished poetry <laughs> together. I don't think we academics are necessarily poetry friends I think we've largely been that with friends like us I don't think you need enemies